come up. So welcome to this um, webinar on climate change and food procurement. Um, it's run as part of the Southwest Food Hub suite of um, webinars we're doing around the, the future food framework and very much looking around to begin with at the influences and influences on public sector public sector food procurement um, so yes yeah, so welcome to that um, just a couple of things i if you could mute, mute yourself that'd be absolutely great um, questions please through the chat function both ellen and i will, will monitor that during the presentations um, and apart from that if you want to put videos on it's great we like to see people otherwise feel free to have your video off we don't mind at all um, don't mind dogs barking in the background or people jumping up and down. Um, so that, that's absolutely fine, um, to however you want to do it. We're hoping to stick to the hour. Um, so I've threatened the, uh, our presenters today, if they go over their lot of time, I will put them on mute um, and <laughs> can go from there. So just be with us. So, and also kind of before I move on to the, so the main bit, just say thank you to our supporters and sponsors in this. I'm working with the Southwest Food Hub in the West of England area. And, and that is made possible by the kind support, support of West of England Combined Authority, so WECA, and the Southwest Food Hub um, is also supported by the partners you see at the bottom of the, of the slide. So we will start. So today's agenda is along these lines. We have, we're obviously looking at climate change, that massive stuff around the public sector. So to start with, we've got Jane Wildblood, the amazing sustainability manager and everything else at the moment, it seems, uh, from Bath North East Somerset Council followed by Rich Osborne, the CEO of Equilibrium Markets, who some of you might know from previously in Fresh Range Incarnation, but doing a massive amount in this field at the moment. A great case study from Stu Rostens, who was at part of um, WASPs back in Bath, now at the Multi Academy Trust, followed by me and then Sian from, from Weka. So we'll rattle through them. Um, I don't mean that kind of in a sort of blasty through way, but just we've got a quite, quite time tale. So I will, first of all, introduce you to Jane and go from there, if that's okay. Jane, over to you. Good idea to unmute then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, hello everyone. Um, and thanks very much, um, Chrissy. Yes, um, I'm, I, I've been working on um, environment and sustainability issues for um, over 30 years now. Um, and I've been in local government for um, about 18 of those, those years. Um, and um, what I want to just talk about, what, what Chrissy's asked me to talk about is a kind of step back for a minute and think about the, the, the big picture. Because one of the things that frustrates me quite a bit working on climate, working on eco ecological emergency, the, the, the sort of suite of environmental emergencies that we are facing, um, is that it, people want very simple black and white um, answers to things. And I think that sometimes the debates around what the solutions are have become unhelpfully polarized from an environmental point of view. So I just want to introduce a bit of kind of big picture thinking, I think, that sits behind what I think we can be doing to influence in a very positive way um, in, in the public sector. So. Um, in Bath North East Somerset, we've declared a climate emergency and we're committed to net zero carbon 2030. We also declared an ecological emergency because of all the you know, obvious things that you will all know about. And we did all of that just before COVID um, happened. And um, I think COVID is really forcing some very new thinking to go on and, and, a, and a coming together um, around issues to do with um, the climate, um, nature, around inequalities, around the future of our economies and so on. And I, I would kind of umbrella that into, we're now having a very active conversation in Bath North East Somerset around green recovery. Um, and and I'm, I'm leading um, that, that, that work. Um, and I think the, you know, the important thing is thinking, I think what it's forcing us, I think the current set of circumstances are forcing us to think um, is, to, is to look at our local area and our local economy in, in a different way. And our objectives are, are um, to, to tackle the climate emergency and, and achieve that 2030 net zero carbon target and um, you know, tackle, tackle the nature emergency, but to do so in such a way that enables our local economy to recover from COVID and, and flourish and become more, more resilient. And for me, um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about the energy system and the need to create a, a, a local renewable energy system that is owned by the community, that is that benefits the community, creates local jobs and so on. And I think we need to have the same thought process around the whole of the food system. And we need to understand that it's not a simple black and white thing just about carbon with food. Um, we've got to think about it in a much more holistic way. Um, food is part of the environment in 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 a in a very deep way that I think people often 
forget and forget about the relationships between the soil, um, biodiversity, food, how and how we actually interact with with nature. So so that's um, that's where I'm kind of coming from is is I think that is that is we need to avoid just talking about carbon. It's not that simple. I'm really worried about soil health. It doesn't get nearly enough airplay and it's it's absolutely vital to our survival and current farming methods, uh, the intensive industrialized farming methods are destroying it. So we need to be thinking about carbon, soil, pesticides and fertilizers. Nitrogen is, a, is, a, is a, an artificial fertilizer that is a huge greenhouse gas emitter on, the, on a par with methane. Um, we need to be thinking about the impact on water courses, on flood defense. We need to be thinking about tree cover. And I get frustrated by the fact that often you have kind of specialists who just look at landscape or just look at at um, trees or something. And we, we've got to look at all of this together. And food, I think, gives you an, a, a, really, a, a really important way in to actually a holistic solution to a whole raft of social and environmental and economic um, problems. We need to think about diet as well. Um, and we need to think about how is food produ production best suited to the local conditions that we have, to our geography, our topography, our weather. And, and often people are completely divorced from all of that, I think, and, and, and don't know where, you know where where is good food sourced from and, and, and all the rest of it. So, um, so I think that's my kind of um, scene setting message is, is, is we need to step back and take a more holistic view, but that I think looking at things like um, how can we develop um, a, a sustainable, regenerative food system that is that is really supplying the local area? Um, how do we get people to understand seasonal food better um, so that they, their carbon footprint is, is reduced? That will increase our resilience, but it also creates a big opportunity for more jobs in the countryside um, alongside how we manage increasing tree cover and all of those um, kinds of things. So I've, I've covered a lot here, but I think the bottom line for me is that that's the policy picture that we should be making ourselves aware of, I think, um, within the public sector. And we're certainly doing that through the new division that we're developing in Bath North East Somerset. Um, and then I think there, are, in terms of the local authority perspective, we've got two really important roles. One is about convening, well, three, I suppose. It, it's convening partners and enabling these discussions to happen on the one hand at a strategic policy level and in, in, in bringing people together who've never come together before. I know Rich was in, in, a, in a workshop that I ran um, as part of our visioning process just before Christmas. And we had a couple of, 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 we had Rich in there and we had a regenerative farmer from our, just outside Bath in there. And we had some local renowned landscape specialists and it was just obvious that they'd never had a conversation. And it's like, hang on guys, you can't talk about the landscape and not talk about food production. Um, so that, so we, we can do that, we can convene and get those, those conversations going. There are things that we, important things we can do through, through the planning system to support this and we're having that conversation as well. And then of course, there's, there's how we can influence the market to support more sustainable um, local food production that benefits um, our local communities um, the most, as well as um, bringing all of those social, environmental um, and, and economic um, benefits. So that's my uh, vision <laughs> for the future and, and where I see, um, you know, public sector food procurement as a, as a key, a, a key um, kind of um, lever um, um, in, in achieving that better, better future that we all want. Brilliant. Thanks, Jane. That's great. That's a perfect scene setting indeed. Thank you. I'm going to... Um... Party on to, to Rich Osborne next. He's on my list. I'm going to just share his video. Bear with me one second. It's a massive file, so it should. Right, do we also, here we are. Okay. Any second now? We will be there. Ah, there we go. Right, Rich, over to you. I'll leave you to introduce yourself as well. Okay, thanks, Chrissy. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Rich. I'm the uh, one of the directors at Equilibrium Markets, uh, which we shortened to EM. Um, and I'm also, uh, alongside Chrissy and a dozen other people, a member of the Dynamic Food Procurement National Advisory Board. Um, today, uh, I've, I really am grateful to Chrissy for offering me the chance to present on this topic. It's probably the most important presentation I've ever given and potentially I'll ever give. Um, and uh, I, 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 there are really three parts to my talk. The first 
is um, I want to just spend a little bit of time building on what Jane said about the problem of our food system with regard to climate change. Secondly, I'm going to offer just four actionable solutions that public sector procurers could consider in order to make a big difference on climate change as a problem. And then a suggested list of some easy next steps at the very end. Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, you, you'll probably have heard of Covey's uh, famous book, uh, the, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he explains how to prioritize things by making a distinction between important and urgent issues. There's no doubt COVID-19 has punched us in the face and presented an urgent challenge to governments globally, but we absolutely must now focus on the arguably, well, in my opinion, it's not even arguable, the more important priority facing us. And so with my presentation today, I'd like to make a plea to you to be part of potentially a very big part of the solution um, with regard to climate change. So, as Jane already said, we've, we've got things terribly wrong on a global level when it comes to food and, and farming. It's, it's understandable why we turn to intensive farming in the first place. You know, the post-World War II world population was booming and there were well-founded concerns. We wouldn't be able to feed ourselves. And, you know, there have been some clear advantages of intensive farming, higher crop yields from less land use. Um, plentiful and very cheap food uh, and particularly in the UK we've benefited from some of the very cheapest food in the world. However what really can no longer be forgivable is our continued practice of some of the most destructive intensive farming methods what, whatever the perceived benefits. For instance our, our reliance on chemical pesticides and fertilizers is, is not sustainable. It's been known for some time that chemicals like that are contaminating rivers and lakes, causing cancers in, the, in human beings that are spraying, uh, contributing to biodiversity destruction on a ridiculous scale. And pro probably most importantly for this presentation, they're raping soils across the world of the, of the matter needed to sequest carbon. And, you know, this is a really critical point when it comes to climate change. Soil holds more than double the carbon that the atmosphere holds and, and three times more than in trees. But the intensive farming practices we've employed over these past several decades is causing carbon to be lost from the soil. So I'll come back to this later, but first, just how significant are the global food systems greenhouse gas emissions as compared with other human caused greenhouse gas emissions such as aviation or energy. The reality is a quarter of all human caused greenhouse gases are caused by the food system. Um, so that's made up of uh, the gases that Jane mentioned, carbon dioxide, the more potent methane and the extremely potent nitrous oxide. Um, and for perspective, the airline industry at pre-COVID levels was contributing just 2% or 1.9% actually of human caused global greenhouse gas emissions. So we're talking about the food system being an order of magnitude bigger in terms of planetary warming impact. And the fact is, if any government is genuinely serious about reaching net zero anytime soon, the food system is inevitably going to be targeted. So how can public sector food procurers help with this? Um, and, and where in the food system are these greenhouse gas emissions actually arising? So most emissions from the food system occur at the agricultural production stage. Um, I don't know about everyone else, but I've got a black box over the slide, Chrissy. I don't know whether that's it, thank you. Um, so this 24% uh, in the middle here, that this is 24% of all human caused emissions. Um, and that's really caused by agricultural production. And emissions 
from all the other processes within the food system after food is produced add just five percent and then at the bottom there all other um, greenhouse gas emissions such as energy transport aviation and others make up the remaining 71 percent of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions and so if we just focus on the 24 percent here Agricultural production means direct emissions from things like fertilizer or pesticide production or energy use for animal feed. And this um, contributes really the great majority of food system greenhouse gas emissions. Farm animals, direct methane and nitrous oxide emissions contribute about half of that 24%. Um, and of course, unfortunately, these emissions have increased a lot in recent years. Uh, largely due to just ongoing unsustainable increases in beef consumption globally. Whilst in the UK, we've actually brought our beef consumption down uh, globally, it's it's soaring. Um, and then the other half of that 24% is basically down to land use changes such as deforestation. So as I said a minute ago, food processing and distribution at the top there is a relatively small contribution. So it's worth bearing in mind that Sometimes you hear people saying we, we, we want to source local food in, in order to reduce food miles. It, that doesn't necessarily minimise a food's life cycle emissions because you might get food from a short distance away, but any production um, impact of producing that food locally could easily outweigh any benefits. So like heating a greenhouse in winter, for example, would, would completely outweigh the benefit of, of lower food miles. So the key point I want to make on this slide is that procurers need to understand how food is being produced. Knowing where it comes from or even who supplies it is, is, is just not enough. And the problem is most honest procurement officers will tell you they have next to no idea about the carbon footprint of the food they're procuring in the public sector. And in fact, even um, in a recent government inquiry, a minister at DEFRA admitted that the government has likely never known where the £2.6 billion a year is being spent on public sector food. So why? Why don't procurers or our government know how food um, is, how the food being consumed in the public sector is, is being produced? Well, the vast majority of food procured in the public sector is quite simply anonymous. Procurers and cooks often have no idea what they're spending their money on because the supply chains are, are too long and opaque. So, you know, when Stu um, is ordering beef, Stu's talking later, um, often he'll be told that, you know, he, he's ordering beef stewing steak and it costs 12 pounds a kilo. Sometimes it, it might say it's, it's red tractor or farm assured beef stewing steak, but that doesn't explain the, the information about the production approach taken. So what has the cattle been fed? How has it been grazed? What, what welfare standards are in place? These are the critical questions he needs to know if, if he's to be able to have any idea about the carbon footprint of the, the menu he's serving. So the, the, the UK imports most of its food and the public sector is no different. Uh, so the uncomfortable truth is we're, we're exporting a great deal of our greenhouse gas emissions associated with our food system. And of course, all emissions, wherever they are, cause warming, you know, be that here in Britain or, or in Brazil, Borneo or, or Bolivia. So to summarize, um, the climate change issue for the food system is, is big and urgent. Uh, if we're going to avoid really dire consequences, we've got to, we've got to fix the food system. The main determinant of greenhouse gas emissions is how food is produced less so the way it's distributed or, or processed. And the reason it's difficult to act is because most, most buyers don't know how food is produced at the point they're procuring or at the point of call off when the cook is actually ordering their food. And what I've observed is, that, is the net result is, is paralysis. Efforts to improve sustainability of food have con just cons consistently failed without addressing the fundamental problem of lack of supply chain transparency. So uh, that's the first part done, the depressing bit. Let's now just spend the, the rest of my um, my time talking about how we can crack on. And and, and I've just made four suggestions 
um, that I, I think are probably the biggest things we can do in the public sector to um, uh, in the next five years to really move us to a better place. The first is um, to avoid meat from intensive feedlots. This is a picture of a of a feedlot with with cattle um, squeezed into small paddocks. Um, you can see there's no green in in the uh, paddocks. It's just dirt, really. It's just dust. Um, so that lends us to believe that they're being fed grain rather than grass. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is this is a picture taken from Google Maps. And you're probably thinking this is somewhere else, yeah, not in Blighty, it's probably over in the US or in Argentina or somewhere else, but actually it's not. This is, this is in Suffolk. And um, the problem is there are more of these feedlots being developed in the UK all the time. Uh, and as the slide says, if you feed cattle grain, that grain could well be being grown in a country abroad um, and it could be it's being grown where forests used to be. So uh, it, it could be a direct contributor to deforestation. There's very good evidence, and I'll come onto that slide in a second, but there's very good evidence um, that this beef is less healthy than native breed, 100% um, pasture fed cattle. And there's also very good evidence to show that feedlot cattle have a much higher net greenhouse gas emissions rate than native breed 100% grass fed cattle that are, are moved around and grazed in a particular way um, to be regenerative. Right, yeah, the next slide just shows a horrible picture of deforestation. And I just wanted to make the point that 80% eight, of um, deforestation is down to agriculture. And the issue with deforestation is it, it obviously releases a lot of CO2. And CO2 is the real permanent greenhouse gas. It never leaves. Once you release it, it, it stays in the atmosphere. So its impact is, is large, despite it being a less potent greenhouse gas than methane or, or even more so nitrous oxide. So next, um, so you don't have a break from hearing from me. I, I, um, I just want to introduce you to um, a video which you know I've said that avoid grain fed intensive meat but you may be asking yourself the question why not just stop eating meat altogether so I thought I'd let the president of the RSPB Miranda Kristofnikov and my second favorite BBC Springwatch presenter Chris Packham answer that question <laughs> Just like energy, cows can be unsustainable, a bit like a bovine coal-fired power station. But they can be sustainable, like solar panels and wind farms. It's often said that cows cause climate change by belching out methane. Well, the truth is that it's intensively reared cows that are the real problem. We all did away with eating meat tomorrow. The UK landscape will be un tremendous pressure and our biodiversity would suffer greatly. Cows reared on grasslands without the need for grain or for fertiliser can be sustainable, especially if the farmers are planting trees alongside too. The science shows us that these pasture-fed livestock can help restore the soil by locking up large amounts of carbon in the soil and in the trees. So while some uh, analyses point to higher methane emissions. Just like any, like, just like any. Whoops. Um, so with, with cattle like, th like these. So some people have argued actually extensively reared cattle that live longer just emit more methane. And, 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 uh, and so actually they're, they're no better than uh, grain fed intensively reared cattle that are slaughtered very quickly. Um, the, that, that misses, part of the point because um, these this cattle are, are associated with much lower carbon dioxide, the permanent greenhouse gas and nitrous oxide than those intensively reared cattle. So the net greenhouse gas profile of, of beef like this um, is substantially lower amongst livestock reared this way. And you know this is a belted galloway, it's a native breed that can stay living on grass all year long. Uh, Clive, this is on Dartmoor, will allow these cattle to graze right through the winter. They can even like dig through snow to eat the grass underneath. So, so by eliminating intensively farmed grain fed meat from our procurement and re-specifying 
our beef products at procurement stage with a lower quantity but higher standard meat like this, um, it, it, it's really possible to generate, and this is a big statement, a net cooling effect on the world's climate. Because if you allow methane levels, because methane levels fall more rapidly than other greenhouse gases, they don't remain in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide. Um, this can actually be a, 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 an immediate net cooling impact. So this is seriously exciting. What I'm saying is that you could act on this issue as a, a food procurer and make an immediate fast and significant contribution to net cooling on earth. So uh, the next uh, suggestion is to increase agroecological or organic fruit, veg, grains and pulses. So you need to reduce meat anyway, uh, replace it with the um, with more environmentally friendly meat, but with the reduction, you also need to increase the fruit, veg, grains, and pulse content of your food. And you know, there's very good data now that shows not only is um, food like agroecological food, or organic food, uh, much lower in terms of greenhouse gas emissions due to um, more humic acid in the soil. Um, so the soil stores more carbon as a result. Um, but but the, You've probably heard the naysayers say for years that you can't feed the world with organic systems, but that now has, has, has been pretty much proven to be wrong. There's, there's a report by the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations that demonstrates a wholesale transition to agroecology, organic practices in Europe um, is feasible. So both in land use and yield terms. So we can feed the population um, this way and food exports can also continue. So there's no economic um, hit either for producers. So, you know, in summary, I, what I'd say about this is right now we're producing intensively and wasting intensively. We need to address both of these issues. Um, and so again, I'd like to call on someone else to back me up here. If you don't believe what I'm saying, here's somebody who's a lot smarter than me uh, saying similar things. It's Professor Alice Roberts. This century we are basically living through the legacy of the Neolithic, the most extraordinary revolution that has ever happened to humanity. We changed from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. It's brought us to the point where we can barely sustain ourselves on this planet. We are producing enough food to feed about 10 billion people, but we waste about a third of the food that we grow. So if we stop doing that, we've got the potential for making sure that nobody goes hungry and that we're still able to preserve as much biodiversity as possible. If we're doing things like feeding grain to livestock, that's, that's not sustainable. I think the biggest challenge facing us this century is to shift the way that we farm, to stop fighting against nature and to find ways to thrive with it. So um food waste is a big problem you know if if basically if food waste were a country it would come in third after all of the emissions of the united states and china uh in terms of impact on global warming it contributes eight percent of total global greenhouse gas emissions um so again just to put that in perspective food waste is four times worse than the entire aviation industry now, the shorter the supply chain, the less likely food waste occurs in the supply chain. Fewer intermediaries, less waste. Um, there are well-established methods to reduce waste at kitchen level, and the public sector needs to embrace those technologies that enable both short supply chains and food waste elimination. So um, that brings me on to the very last bit of my presentation, which is, um, you know, really what should the public sector do next? And why, why am I sort of hypothesizing that really the public sector should be the, the ones that act first? You know, surely the private sector catering market or grocery market is bigger and has more budget. Well, there, there are really three reasons I, I think public sector needs to go first. Um, first of all, you know, the 2.6 billion pounds we spend a year is, is public money in the public sector food market and public money should be used for public good. The fact is um, a lot of us eat a public sector meal each day. So this is the second issue, the second reason, you know, the impact can be an inspiration for those people. There's one in four of us have a public sector meal each day. If we can create a positive food environment when they have it, 
it could inspire them to be um, change agents as well. And the other reason is that um, changing the supply chain for better in the public sector has historically led to changes in other sectors. So, for instance, with sustainable fish over recent years, um, it was the public sector that first set up those supply chains on sustainable fish. And now you see those sustainable fish products appearing in the supermarket and, and in restaurants and, and cafes. Um, I'm really encouraged by the fact that uh, the C40, which is the group of 40 different mayors across the world, um, 17 of the cities in the C40 across, across the world have committed to a net zero diet by 2030. So change is happening um, already globally. And every one of those cities have, have said that public sector is the primary pillar where, where they're going to change first. Um, and then this next slide just shows there are initiatives coming that I think will really help to um, communicate about carbon throughout the supply chain right to the end consumer. So in the top, that top circle, you can see um, a measurement of carbon dioxide equivalent. But at the bottom, you can see how there are now calculations that can be made that, that can show a restaurant or a catering establishment what the cost of their carbon footprint is to offset and how they could effectively charge that to their end consumer um, and make it much more visible in cost terms what, um, what the carbon footprint of different dishes are. So uh, finally, um, in conclusion, really public sector food procurement is is often cited as a potential catalyst for change. Um, the point I really want you to take away today is that you need short, transparent, sustainable food supply chains if you're going to do that. And then final slide, um, it's just, I'm gonna leave this one with you. I think you can get the slides from, um, from Chrissy. I just put together sort of five um, steps over the next five years that one could take in public sector to, to uh, easy next steps effectively. Um, if you haven't already signed up for Food for Life, they have a great um, uh, program called the Green Kitchen Standard that helps catering organizations become more carbon friendly. Um, implement dynamic food procurement, make sure you've got supply chain transparency. Once you've got that, you can then engineer menus um, and then identify and eliminate food waste is the fourth. Uh, and then finally, um, try and incorporate a, a larger percentage of organic or agroecological fruit and veg into your diets. That's me done. Thanks, Chrissy. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, apologies if you're all sort of like doom and gloom from that, but I think there is probably a, probably a way forward. So thank you very much for that. And actually, Rich, because Jane was five minutes early, you got five minutes extra. So that was perfect. <laughs> So we're spot on timing. I am going to pass you on to, to Stu um, and he'll introduce himself as well. I have apologies to make. I tend to play word bingo around these kind of sessions where you're feeding this as an appetite for that. And I'm really sorry, Stu. You've come into that one with, with your name as well. So I've added that onto the list. My apologies. Um, let me put your presentation up and we'll be there in one second. Everyone see that? Yep. Cool. Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Stu. Um, I've been working in the public sector for about 15 years, uh, working throughout schools, um, old people saying things like that. But most recently, I would probably say the most last 12 years, I've been working in schools. So I was fortunate enough to um, work alongside uh, Rich when he was part of, well, his group was part of the Fresh Range um, for the dynamic food procurement pilot. So I was the executive chef at a school in Bath and I've done a lot of work with Rich. So today I've been asked by Chrissy um, just to present a bit of a case study um, and talk to you about a few things that I've done, where I am um, and where I'd like to see things go in the future really. Um, so yeah, I think we can skip on to the next one, Chrissy, I think. So first of all, it all starts with my passion of food really. Um, I love cooking from scratch. 
Um, I don't like processed foods. I like to source locally. Um, and I love feeding the children and, you know, sharing my stories with them about where our food comes from, how it's grown, where, you know, and, and wherever possible, I like to also like remove ultra processed foods from my kitchen. Um, as you'll see from my menu, um, there's a lot of organic, there was a lot of farm assured um, products. So I've lost myself a little bit. <laughs> um, to think where I was. So yeah, so in my menu, you'll see there's um I do a meat free a meat free day, but we also offer we offered a lot of vegetarian choice through through the rest of the week, which is really highly popular. A lot of children took up the veggie option as well. Um, I no longer so I'm, I'm now working for a new company, um, and part of my role coming in is that we. We don't accept any low welfare meats and things. I'm just really struggling actually with suppliers at the moment to try and source those ingredients. I've found one guy local. Um, but again, it's just it's, it's just about getting that right. And most importantly, it's about hitting budget as well. Um, so when I was at Wasps, I had a meal budget of 87 pence for a two course meal. So I had a lot of work to do, but it, I was fortunate enough to work with Rich at Fresh Range, where we could work with local suppliers um, and bring that cost down, which is something that we that I had to really work hard on. I think we can move across now, Chrissy. Um, so I'd like to take just a few minutes to share with you some of the examples that we achieved, how we achieved this. So first of all, the, the dynamic food procurement approach enabled us to work with our partner agent, which was fresh range at the time where we could identify key ingredients where a short supply chain would, would help us. We needed the support, su short supply chain to be able to source the food that met the highest standards we were looking for. So you can see there, there's a picture of me with Stu uh, Perkins. He's a farmer and the owner of Castle Meat Poultry in Radstock. So it's about 30 minutes from where my school was based. Um, I got to see like all the birds roaming around. So we had turkeys, geese, uh, chickens, of course. Um, and one year I actually used this turkey on my menu for Christmas. It was that little bit pricier, but actually the quality was just second to none. And it was clearly picked up through the people that were eating it as well. It was start there was starting to be a lot of difference um, with people coming back on the feedback of the quality of meats and things like that. And it was really good to know where our stuff was coming from. You know, I think there's a lot of a lot of stuff in the public sector. You know, I think working back through who I've worked for over the years, that there was I didn't always know where my stuff was coming from. So working with Rich, I was able to to find out where my things were coming. Well, my, where my food was coming from. And then we went on to buy in Lowerhurst organic meatballs, which was really good. So we sourced these um, again through the dynamic uh, procurement platform. It was the first time we'd had organic meat on our menu. This was due to a really clever recipe that was used within the meatballs by blending um, organic vegetables with organic beef from the farm. And I served the, you can serve these, um, a dish with lower meat content, but, but with much hot, with a much quality, sorry, better quality meat. And I usually made them with like a tomato sauce and things. Um, there is only one way that you can really incorporate much more environment, environmentally friendly meat without exceeding budget. This is because each meatball is slightly smaller in the size than the normal meatballs and also has a slightly lower meat content and has higher organic vegetable content. So they're, they're a brilliant product and they're a win for the children because they love eating them. They're a win for the children because they're healthier. They're a win for the animals because of the higher welfare, win for the environment, and they were a win for my budget. So I couldn't, couldn't praise them high enough. And actually, it just I think it showed it in my uptake across, across the schools. Um, and then we're gonna go on to talk about Farm Wilder, which Rich covered a little bit in his clip. So I was really inspired to try uh, Farm Wilder because of what they're doing for the wildlife in Dartmoor. They manage about 15,000 acres of land. 
there and they're helping to bring back biodiversity that is endangered, like the butterflies that were pictured there. Um, it's sourced from their farms that are either 100% pasture fed or on the way to being 100%. Um, and this is the bit that really helps in making the beef lowering greenhouse gas emissions. Once we tried the meat, we discovered it was just simply the best tasting beef ever. And I actually converted my own mum to, uh, to, to, to buying better quality meat. You know, it's, and I actually, I think just before uh, lockdown last year, I think I bought quite a bit of, bit of beef from Rich uh, through, his, through his store and uh, got my family trying it. And I've got to say, just the feedback from the children as well. I, you know, there is that, do children really know or can they really taste the difference in the food? And they can. The stories we got back was like, stew, this meat was so flavoursome. It actually felt like that, you know, there, there was something to it where over-processed meat just becomes, well, there is nothing to it, is there? It's just bland and, and boring. Um, and we were able to incorporate this on our menu um, at a cost because there was weeks where I'd make say a curry with it and then the following week I'd make a veggie curry so I was able to bring these ingredients in and things so it was such an amazing thing to do and I miss it a lot and again with organic veg season uh, we introduced more and more organic veg um, to the menu when the veg was local in the season, but by keeping the menu flexible, by listing seasonal organic vegetables on it, we were never committed to buying just one vegetable. It meant we could just buy whatever was being produced at the time. Um, and it also encouraged us to grow at school. You know, lots of our children became, um, I can't think of the word I need to use, but they, yeah, they, they, they become very interested in where our food was coming from and how could they grow it and how could they do it like that. And I was fortunate enough to, how to be able to have land at the school so we were able to do all these things and it's important to keep that passion for cooking in the kitchen um and we often found out when we ordered in the local veg rather than it being important we were so much more inspired to cook the produce was much more friendly and visually delicious when it had literally just been picked from the farm up the road and then moving on lastly um Communication to parents was a really key factor for us. Um, and I had the support with Rich and his team with this. Um, so we were averaging, I think I said earlier, when I took the school on about four years ago, uptake was about 40%. And as we started to bring all this new thing in, you know, with sourcing locally with meat, finding out where our veg and all our meat was coming from, our uptake very quickly went up to about 60%. And then just before I left, we were about 85, 89% uptake across the school. So that made a huge difference to, to everybody. And normally these letters go out quarterly to, to parents and so on and so forth. And I think that's just about me covered, I think. I think I covered that just now, I think we're saying about you know, how we got our optimum meal take up, interacting with children, interacting with parents, you know, involving local suppliers and things. So, yeah, I'm sorry I started a bit, guys. This is a bit new for me. I'm better off in a room, but um, thank you for your time. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. I will sort of slightly clap you while we're on mute. No, that was great. Thank you. Um, so I think that I, I really like um, Stu's case study. I, I, he worked very hard to get that through um, and make those changes, but it really was an, kind of quite a good case, study, a really good case in saying it is possible when, when we're looking at those sorts of changes. Right, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to do a very quick thing on how we can link into, into the, um, what we're doing next around procurement within the Southwest Food Hub and, and Crack Commercial Service. I'm just going to share my screen again. Sorry, several presentations. Um, going through, it's just, I'm just going to click through some of these. Um, all right. And this isn't a technical presentation about the procurement side of it. It is just kind of a, a kind of introduction going, really addressing some of the issues that's been raised before on a kind of much kind of um, higher level rather than in detail. And it's not Jane either. Um, so just kind of moving on from there. I don't know if I said right at the beginning who I am. I'm, I'm Chrissy Story. <laughs> so I, I think I missed that fairly important bit out. So. Um, great, right, I shall start. 
So I was just kind of thinking when I was looking at putting the session together, going just imagine um, if you can, if you're a procurement, if you're a supplier, if you're a teacher, if you're a parent, if you're sitting in a hospital, a food procurement contract that can consistently deliver all the issues that we've been um, looking at this morning. So the shorter supply chains, the stuff around um, supply chain transparency, stuff growing closer to home because it's more transparent and also working with the those producers who are supporting the environment and biodiversity. And also on that side of it as well, not just the kind of how it's being produced and supplied and all the rest of it, but also how it is being moved around. I know Rich was saying, you know, sometimes the logistics and the transport is, is the lesser part of the carbon bit, but actually it's still quite important. On the, on the Baines um, contract that I was part of, after a year we did some carbon emission reduction measurements and it was significantly lesser, less than the, than, the, than the contract before, just because of the way it was set up and managed and backhauling and backfilling on, on various um, on various uh, um, transport and all the rest of it. But just imagine that contract that can that can deliver on some of this climate change mitigation, the small pilot in Baines did, but actually we need that on a grander scale. You know, I love Baines to bits, but it's quite a small authority and it was only I don't know, 63 schools and part of that, but what can we do on a kind of national scale? Well, the good news is plans are in place for this to, to, to get that rolled out and how. Well, the future food framework, which you may or may not heard of, um, is a pilot which is about to be run by the South, by the Crown Commercial Service, so the, the procurement arm of the government in, this, in the Southwest. And it's based on the dynamic, the emerging model of dynamic free procurement, which is really three interlinking contracting arrangements, but which, which allows for fluidity within the contracts. So not stopping and having a contract which is maybe for four, four years with one or two suppliers having to produce everything, but getting lots of suppliers on board to actually meet need and meet demand, but also from the public sector, also kind of creating that demand to support those producers and suppliers as well. The aim is for it to go live, the whole thing to go live in the next 12 months, all three contracts linked together. Um, it's dependent on CCS timing, but that's the expectation and the kind of time scale we have. In terms of procurement, it seems a long way away, you know, but think how quickly the last 12 months has gone. And what will it actually do? Primarily it'll open up opportunities for local sustainable producers. And not all local is sustainable, ready to admit that, but looking at kind of sustainable producers with the really good welfare standards, what they're doing for the environment, how they're engaging people, how they're getting their products and making them available. But really, there's a lot of um, targets around like 33% which need to meet on SMEs, but quite often it's the M side of SMEs that are, that are being involved. It's not the S element. And we really want to kind of get the S element on board, the smaller ones rather than the kind of the medium ones, which are almost pseudo large. It will develop short supply chains without a doubt. The way the contracts are being set up, those supply chains will be short. It will reduce emissions. A, you're looking at farmers, also looking at transport logistics, and also hopefully that waste issue will be tackled quite strongly as well through it. And will make it simple for procurers to access suppliers. And procurers are great people. They do really good stuff, but they're expected to be experts in every single type of market they, they touch. There's very few people who only do food. And to make a contract which makes it easy for them to access suppliers, which can match their needs, is really quite a, is, is a, is a major way forward. And ultimately the increase in transparency, where it's coming from, who's it going to, what's it doing, how, it's, how is it being produced, and, and how are the resources being used. So what's happening already? So the procurement of the, of the, of the first stage was that a tech platform will start shortly. Um, we're waiting for the paperwork to come up on that one. At the moment, it's limited to kind of fresh um, categories, such as meat, fruit and veg, dairy, bakery goods, and all the rest of it, but it will expand. We're very conscious of the fact that we need more than that on, on just on, on this sort of um, arrangement. We've started the supplier engagement. The Southwest Food Hub are working closely with Crown Commercial Service to do extensive procurement supplier engagement. We've started the kind of softer engagement. Um, the more technical elements will come once we've got that first contract in place and they'll be working both with procurers on the technical side, but also working with suppliers, even handholding them through the process when we need to do it, because many of them won't have actually touched um, public sector procurement before. It's an initial pilot of one year, but actually that's not going to stop after one year. Within weeks of it going, the whole thing going live, evaluation will start on those systems and processes. And once those are embedded and working properly, there will be a national rollout. So we're not just talking about a local contract in terms of it being kind of the southwest or west of England. This is an arrangement that will roll out across the UK. But even with the kind of the rollout across the UK, it'll still have those local suppliers to wherever they, the procurers are as part of that um, 
part of that, that's it set up and, and working forward. But one thing that's absolutely crucial, the success of it relies on both procurers and suppliers getting on board. If we don't have one, we don't have the other. And that would be an absolute travesty, bearing in mind this is a, a procurement arrangement that could really just transform fresh food procurement in the UK. As I said, it was only a kind of brief linking presentation from the rest of them to, to the actual food framework, future food framework. Um, we will be getting more technical stuff out shortly, but any questions in the meantime, either through the chat, feel free to email me at chrissy at the southwestfoodhub.uk or visit the, the website, the southwestfoodhub.co.uk. Don't forget the out of before the, before the Southwest, otherwise it goes somewhere else. This um, recording of this particular um, webinar and most of the others that we've done in the future will be up there for as, as, a, as a resource to go forward from here. So that's my short piece, so thank you for that. I am now going to stop sharing and introduce you to our WECA um, element to it. As I mentioned, we are supported very heavily by WECA and this is part of their kind of growth hub function. And, and they're, 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 yeah, there's their support bits. So I'm just going to pass you on to Sian for her short presentation as to exactly what that is and what that entails. So bear with me one second. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the, um, the talk so far. They've been absolutely fascinating. Cool. I've lost all yours. Do you want me? Ah, there you go. <laughs> get it. Yeah, there you go. Ah, perfect. So, um, hi everyone. So I know that there's a there's a mixture of procurers, councils, um, business business development um, today. So great to meet you all. So I'm Sian. I'm an enterprise executive for West of England Combined Authority Growth Hub. We um, climate we as an organization declared a climate emergency it's a really critical agenda for us we have got an aim to make things carbon neutral like many um growth hubs and organizations across the globe um, by 2030 and we support all different kinds of businesses, but in particular food businesses, we have set up a food and rural task force and we support a lot of food and rural businesses in the region. So um, essentially today's just gonna to be a, a short whiz through of, so if you do know of any food businesses in the Southwest region that need support, um, and I'm just going to go through some of the kind of the support that we provide food businesses or we, we have provided as well um, since COVID and, and um, we've adapted a lot of our services um, as a result of uh, COVID as well. So uh, one of the key things that we provide is business growth support. So in line with their clean and sustainable growth goals, we support businesses um, and provide fully funded support um, for food and rural businesses. Uh, this can be startups, scale ups, whatever their growth goals are. Um, and uh, we support them by providing them to trade better online. Um, so that can be helped with their marketing, strategy, digital. Uh, we support with things like adoption of tech. So improving their processes. So Rich has talked a lot of today and Stuart about improving the processes. We've got kind of a productivity challenge and we can support businesses to uh, do that and, and analyze that. And we've got different, a whole host of different partners that we work with that um, can support with that. Um, we have got an accountancy support program to support them understand uh, things about their cash flow, financial strategy, app and all of those kinds of things. We do workforce and computer support. So we support them with um, planning. So a lot of our food businesses have seen, especially the ones that are, um, have got lots of different uh, strands to their food and rural business. So, so farmers that maybe have got co-working spaces, post offices um, and, and uh, food cafes and things have ha had to shift everything due to COVID and so they've had to up their upskilling their workforce and considering their workforce now and build, building their business resilience and so we've got a program to support them kind of identify their skills needs and plan for the future um, regardless of COVID and things like that and beyond. 
Um, we've got leadership development programs, so we provide access to um, peer networking, we can signpost to mentoring schemes, uh, support them with hiring if they're growing or want to grow. Uh, we can support with innovation support, so if they are a food business that wants um, funding, maybe they have got a sustainable food process, uh, they've got a new piece of machinery that they've developed and they maybe need support with IV, IP and innovation, then we can provide funding for that. We provide support with export. So food businesses that have struggled, I know there's still kind of some uncertainties around that. So we work with partners in order to kind of demystify the landscape for um, people that are exporting food um, but also that want advice on making these supply chains that you've said so making things cleaner um, and um, changing their supply chain so to make it shorter for example as well. Um, we work with host of partners um, as well so we can support them in line with their growth goals so lawyers and things like that. Uh, in terms of environmental support, we provide, we've got lots of partners that we work with to support with sustainability. So internally, we do carbon check for businesses, um, climate change impact assessments. We also provide green business grants. So if they want to, they've got a food building and they want to use solar panels and things like that, then we can um, provide grant funding for SMEs in order to support them. Uh, we also uh, work really closely with other partners that uh, can provide specialist advice. So everything from things like eco packaging, um, technical certificates, labeling and, and, and things like that. Um, and like I said, we, we also were uh, a, and are a voice for food and rural businesses as part of the recovery task force. So they've played an active role in helping us plan for how we pivot the region um, and all the support that we provide. And we've adapted everything in response to what food businesses and of other sectors have said. So um, that's really important to us as well. So yeah, so if you've got any questions in relation to that, if you're a business or know of any businesses, then definitely get in touch and we can provide fully funded support. And thank you again. I think this is such a fantastic, vital um, project. Um, and yeah, it's nothing more important right now, I think. So thank you. Thank you, Sam, that's great. That's brilliant. And we are spot on end of timing as well. Um, I would just like to say thank you very much to everybody on the call. We are just on 11.30, so that's absolutely perfect. I'd like to say thank you very much to us, to the to the speakers, um, who I think have been quite passionate about what they're talking about and very, very invested in, in all the rest of it. Um, and I hope that's given you kind of food for thought. Um, sorry about the pun. I can't think of another one at the moment. Um, and yeah, so this will, I say this will be available on the Southwest Food, the recording will be available on the Southwest Food Hub site in the next few days, a couple of weeks. Um, we have another webinar running on the 2nd of March, along a similar sort of theme, but looking at healthy eating and food procurement. Um, for those who are interested, we have Grace Davis, who's a public health professional at Bristol City Council, who's one of the few public health people I know who knows public health and food procurement. Um, Phil Shelley, who ran the, was a, the, chair, the chair of the National NHS Food Reviews Board, and Mars Bremner, who was the former national director of the school food plan. So that's our next webinar that's coming up. But in the meantime, thank you very much for participating today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and I hope it's given you some, um, some from, yes, something to go and think about. Um, yes, and good, thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>